Hi, this is Dr. Gabriel Chu from the Fraser Valley Cataract and Laser Center from Surrey, British Columbia, Canada. And today we're going to be showing you another video in our series um, for intermediate and veteran surgeons on how to do routine cataract surgery in about five minutes or under. And um, I know everybody has a different uh, technique and different uh, training, but um, uh, I'll tell you about my experience, and uh, this may also have some um, tidbits uh, for newer surgeons as well. Uh, and the key thing is to um, improve safety as well as um, improve speed uh, thereafter. So um, without further ado, let's uh, start the video. So here we've just started um, the video after the prep and the speculum. I do a single planar stab incision um, doing an anterior paracentesis with a one millimeter microblade. With my uh, 2.5 keratome, um, I make a uh, limbal clear corneal incision, single uh, planar into the anterior chamber. And you may have noticed very quickly that I've also done a stab incision um, right onto right into the um, anterior capsule to make a, um, to make a rent. And uh, I use a uh, viscoelastic uh, to quickly inflate the anterior chamber. And um, right away, um, because I've already made a rent, I can go straight into um, a three to four grasp uh, capsorexis with Utrata. After um, making the uh, complete uh, capsorexis, then I'll do a double wave. And what I mean by that is I use a 27 gauge cannula to uh, basically make a double wave. And then I just ensure that the, um, the cataract is free. I don't necessarily rotate each and every time. When uh, I go into FACO um, emulsification, uh, I go in under reflux so that I don't lose the anterior chamber. Um, and the viscoelastic doesn't come, uh, doesn't come rushing out uh, before the irrigation hits the anterior chamber. I use a chopper, and um, I've switched from a divide and conquer to a chop technique. And right here, I'm going to do a primary chop. And you'll see that I subtly just kind of move the uh, cataract a little bit um, so that I can get a good engagement there. And then uh, go straight into the center of the nucleus, uh, trying to keep the fecal tip very central. And then I do a horizontal uh, primary chomp and I bring it right into the, uh, the middle and, um, and separate the two pieces. I want to see a complete chop. And uh, I do favor horizontal chop. Uh, and sometimes if I cannot do a horizontal chop, I go to a vertical primary chop. After the first piece comes out, the other pieces uh, have room to, uh, to maneuver and um, the rest of the um, Hemi nucleus, uh, both of them will easily uh, come out. And uh, during the phaco emulsification, my second uh, hand is quite active. Uh, so as I'm phaco emulsifying, I'm also chopping at the same time. And uh, at this point, we have a little bit of epinucleus and a little bit of um, cortex left. So um, I'm going to be moving on to the IA. And I just uh, switched it here. Sorry for the video quality. It is 4K, but sometimes the uh, capture rate may not be too high. Hopefully it's uh, fairly um, fairly clear. So I uh, remove the um, cortex in um, circular fashion, always taken from the leading edge so I can um, make sure there's not too many adhesions. I use a combination of both um, foot um, position two as well as mechanical stripping to uh, very quickly remove the, uh, uh, the cortex. Um, and uh, when I did the physical elastic there, I, own, I primarily um, inflated the capsular bag and not the anterior chamber very much there. Uh, I, the rest of the anterior chamber is inflated by the, just a little bit of, uh, that was on the tip of the cartridge there. Uh, this is an Oculentis M plus lens that I put into the capsular bag. And um, it is a toric lens, so I'm going to rotate it into position. Uh, I've already pre-marked the cornea to make sure that I have the right axis. As I'm positioning, I'm also removing viscoelastic. And at the end of the case, uh, all I'm doing is making sure that the, um, the wounds are hydrated and sealed and the anterior chamber is, um, is reinflated and that we have good pressure and that the lens is uh, properly in place. 
Uh, that was at a one-time speed. I know I was speaking pretty quickly, but there are nuances throughout the entire procedure that um, I'm going to slow down to half speed right after this. So uh, this video is different from the other videos because I'm going to play the exact same video at half speed to see if I can talk about the uh, nuances of each and every step, how to make it safer uh, and quicker. The cataract surgery that I was trained to do was divide and conquer, um, and also with uh, multiple steps and multiple instruments that I've slowly through the years have done away with. And some of the processes I've uh, even combined, uh, for example, I don't I no longer use a Sinsky. Uh, and I no longer use the, the multiple instruments I was trained to, to use. And of course, I switched to chop technique. Okay, so let's uh, go into, into this. There's the um, anterior paracentesis. Sorry for the video being so slow. I'm going to try to talk as quick as possible so that I can kind of outline some of the nuances that I do each and every step. Uh, and because uh, many things are combined together, I'm going to try to address most of them. There's the single uh, planar stab uh, incision as well as the single planar um, main main wound 2.5 millimeter uh, keratome and the tip of it just touched the center of the anterior capsule so there is a very small rent right into the right in the middle uh, it's slightly obscured by the light reflex there what i'm doing here is non-preserve one uh, percent lidocaine i do it slowly uh, i do it in multiple um, um, injections so that I can slow myself down and improve patient comfort. And patient comfort is important because you don't want them fidgeting and moving around. Uh, my viscoelastic, I do what they call a viscoelastic um, aqueous exchange. So I try to go to the far end and uh, basically exchange one volume for the other one. Um, so it comes out very quickly. Uh, since I've already made a rent in the anterior chamber, I can very easily find it. Uh, use the tip of my sharp utratus and uh, start my capsular rexus. And you can go uh, any way that you're comfortable um, and uncomfortable kind of going down and then around. And I try to do about three or four grasps. Um, and uh, it, with each uh, grasp, uh, I do a C motion. So I set myself up for the next grasp. And that's very important because you do not want to be searching around for the next grasp or leaving it flat where it's hard to, uh, hard to find. Um, now I'm doing what they call, what I call a double wave uh, hydrodissection and then hydrodelineation. And uh, I used to rotate, but I don't rotate anymore. This is a 27 gauge cannula with VSS. And uh, as long as I know there's a double wave, then I know it's relatively loose. And, um, and uh, I won't uh, go ahead and rotate. Sometimes I find that the, the, the uh, single instrument rotation uh, tends to not work very well um, uh, or uh, it doesn't indicate very well that the uh, cataract is indeed uh, loose enough um, that you can continue on with the phaco emulsification and easily rotate it. And I'll show you why uh, in a little bit here. So uh, I go in, uh, into the anterior chamber under reflux, uh, so I don't lose the anterior chamber, as I mentioned before. And uh, to improve my view, I try to get rid of most of the bubbles. And I, I start off in sculpt so I can get rid of the cortex. Uh, and then I can gauge uh, directly with the epinucleus and the nucleus. Uh, very quickly, I'm going on to my second instrument, and I myself use a chopper, um, but I know there's other instruments that uh, you can use as well, whatever is most comfortable uh, for you. Once the cortex has been removed, um, we will directly engage the epinucleus. And what I usually do here is uh, instead of trying to point my uh, phaco instrument straight down into the nucleus. I try to move it with my second instrument. I don't know if it demonstrates very well here, but I just move it over just maybe a couple millimeters here, and you might see it right about now. A couple millimeters, and I engage just at the proximal uh, part of the nucleus there, so that by the time I'm in the middle uh, of the nucleus, then I'm also right in the center uh, uh, of the eye as well, so I'm not too far out into the periphery. Then I go back into foot position uh, two where I can hold it and then make a full uh, horizontal chop. Um, if I only get a partial chop uh, on one end, I'll slowly make my way back and complete the entire uh, hemi-nuclear chop. After the first um, 
primary chop, the secondary chop is also important. I try to make it a little bit smaller so I can get that piece out. Uh, I usually try to get just one end out, and once the one end comes out, then you can fake emulsify it uh, at the same time, and the rest of it will come as well. Now that you have one piece uh, removed, the other pieces now have uh, room to maneuver, and uh, it's easier to, re to remove larger and larger pieces now. And you see this piece is uh, slightly larger than the last one, and uh, I'm, us I'm using mostly FACO energy here. Uh, but with this hemi nucleus, I'm going to show you how I uh, save on power. I'm going to FACO emulsify the whole hemi nucleus and chop at the same time. So my secondary instrument is quite um, uh, active and mobile. Uh, and it's also uh, slightly lower uh, than my FACO tip for good reason, uh, just in case the poster capsule tries to jump and I can uh, have another layer of protection just in case. Um, here I'm left with epinucleus and uh, cortex, uh, a very thin layer of epinucleus actually. If I can't uh, uh, remove the epinucleus in the epinuclear stage, uh, I'll go directly straight to uh, IA for both safety as well as for speed. Um, because if you don't have good purchase um, with a larger phaco tip, then the IA is um, safe enough to remove it quite quickly. I move in semicircular fashion here, so with a mechanical stripping. So once I have a good um, uh, hold purchase, I'll mechanically strip and then take it. So uh, I'm feathering um, the the hold uh, in the vacuum, uh, so that I just have a hold, and then I and then I pull, and then I take the rest. Okay, works very well. And it's only the uh, sub incisional cortex that sometimes I'll have to uh, switch over um, to the other side and just kind of mostly use um, suction to remove the rest of it. And um, now I'm just removing wisps from the posterior capsule, but that um, uh, that you can leave as well. When I do my viscoelastic here, I use cohesive viscoelastic because very easily uh, uh, in and out. Uh, and uh, right here, I only fill the capsular bag. The anterior chamber, there's a little bit there, but I find the rest of it uh, on the end of this cartridge will kind of fill the anterior chamber anyway. I'm using my secondary instrument here as a um, counter traction here to try to get that, um, the tip in here. And sometimes I need to do a, a twisting motion just to get it get it in so it doesn't get caught on the edge of the wounds. This is an Oculantis M plus lens, so it comes out quite quickly. So my secondary instrument uh, is also there to guide the, um, the speed as well as the positioning of the reopening. So it goes straight into the bag. Sometimes it doesn't go straight into the bag. You do have a little bit of troubles just getting uh, getting the lens uh, in afterwards uh, by trying to rotate or uh, trying to do an intraocular maneuver. Uh, but if you get it straight into the bag, then that's um, that's generally the best the best way of doing it. I do pre preoperative markings, so I know exactly where the toric uh, has to sit. And as I'm maneuvering the lens, uh, I'm also removing viscoelastic to, to save time there. And you can go straight to foot position three here because the lens is in place and the viscoelastic comes out co um, as a co in a cohesive manner. And um, yeah, that's the end of the case. Uh, I usually, at the end of the case, I um, just want to make sure that the wounds are sealed by hydrating them with a 27 gauge with, um, with BSS. Um, especially the main wound. And then um, once I feel that's uh, well sealed, then I'll move over to the paracentesis to um, titrate the IOP. And I tap on the cornea just to make sure that I have um, not too high, but also not too low of a pressure. Too low of a pressure will cause the um, uh, to the, the eye to be hypotenuse. And then of course, uh, the self-sealing wounds do not really work very well, uh, of which mine are single plane. Uh, and of course, too high, it will lead to other issues as well. So um, I do try to um, make sure um, I finish uh, with a good with a good pressure here. During this time, if the lens tries to spin or move, uh, this is a fairly large lens, so it's not trying to spin. Uh, then I will go through my para and just uh, use the tip of my cannula to um, make very small adjustments. Uh, if the lens moves too much, then I will go back with my IA tip um, 
to uh, try to maneuver the lens back back in. But very often, um, you know, you'd be surprised that you can you can rotate the lens quite a bit through the para and your uh, and your cannula. Well, thanks for joining me today again, uh, and hopefully that that helps with the uh, little nuances and steps of uh, the cataract surgery. I know I had to speak uh, quite quickly because there's multiple steps being done at the same time. And uh, it, I thank uh, one of my students and uh, one of my residents who watched my video and said, oh, you should do one at regular speed and one at a half speed so you can better talk about the different steps of the surgery. So hopefully that proves helpful. And if there's any questions, of course, uh, here's our contact information. Thanks for watching. Bye-bye.